everybody, this is the uh, lecture on fragment sample and remix. This is our final slash last project, not a final in the terms of a cumulative uh, exam. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about um, was about the computer and about narrative and borrowing and appropriation in this project. This is a quote, uh, well, it's a quote from a book called The Language of New Media by Lev Manovich. He used to teach at UC San Diego. I don't know if he's still there or not. But uh, he did recognize a lot of like more ontological habits of computing that we now take for granted that are invisible to us. Onto ontological mean, meaning the, the reason that it's there. The database logic. After the novel, and subsequently cinema, privileged narrative as the key form of cultural expression of the modern age, the computer age introduces its correlate, the database. Many new media objects do not tell stories. They do not have a beginning or an end, and in fact, they do not have any development thematically, formally, or otherwise that would organize their elements into a sequence. Instead, they are collections of individual items, with every item possessing the same significance as any other. Of course, not all new media objects are explicitly databases. Computer games, for instance, are experienced by their players as narratives. In a game, the player is given a well-defined task, winning the match or winning the race, being the, being the first in the race, reaching the last level or attaining the highest score. It is this task that makes the player experience the game as a narrative. Everything that happens to her in a game, all the characters and objects she encounters, either take her closer to achieving the goal or further away from it. Thus, in contrast to a database, which always appears arbitrary because the user knows additional material could have been added without modifying the logic, in a game, from the user's point of view, all the elements are motivated by action, and that action can be thought of as an algorithm. I'm going to go back in history a little bit. Um, this is the German mathematician and philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, uh, and um, he was a contemporary of uh, Newton. And um, he developed uh, a use for the binary system, ones and zeros, which um, he put to use in this uh, calculating machine, which could do uh, subtraction, multiplication, division, and the extractions of square roots and things like that of numbers. And part of what this was was it, what he. The reason why I'm showing you this is because it was one of the more one of the first systematic uses uh, in Europe. I want to make that really clear because the base 10 system was used by the Inca many, many years prior to this. Uh, but it was a base 10 system, and it was a binary system of 1, 0, on, off, yes, no, that kind of thing. So it's a logical um, process that this machine uses to derive numbers, and that there is a kind of predictability to the way numbers would work in a particular set of um, uh, circumstances. So, for ex for example, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division are fairly predictable um, subroutines that you can run on any quantity of, of items and get a predictable amount. So, one of the things, one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is because I think it's interesting historically looking at this is that this is one of the first attempts to kind of abstract um, the regularity of knowledge or the regularity of results based upon um, a predictive uh, kind of method. Now this is not necessarily an algorithm, this is more of a database that keeps track of things sort of systematically. Okay. Um, and I, what I'm getting at here you guys is I'm, I'm trying to paint a picture for you in terms of the remix as um, in two ways. One way I want to talk to you about it in terms of it being um, uh, looking at narrative and how we tell stories to one another and how stories are referential. Remember in our first module we talked about um, synecdoche, which is a part to whole relationship. And you can think of these as kind of packages, and I'll go over this when I talk about the ARPANET in a minute. Um, where it intersects with digital technology is that the computer uh, that you're using even to watch this operates um, both algorithmically and uh, in a database kind of format. In other words, there are predictable combinations of actions that produce predictable combinations of results, and that's reliability. 
And that reliability can be built into things. So for example, a filing system is also a very similar type of, of a database system, right? So you go into a file cabinet, you pull out a folder, you get the stuff in the folder, you put it back, right? You know it's there. Um, algorithms, however, have more to do with um, undertaking a set number of parameters or, or uh, activities. Um, in the case of computers, input, and that, that combination of things operates as um, a prompt for something else to happen. And that's more often than not what drives video games. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a very early version of the computer, which I thought was kind of interesting because it's more or less like a furniture version of an iPad or, uh, or just a desktop computer. It was called the Memex. And what you would do is you'd sit there and um, I believe this was invented by a guy named Vannevar Bush. Um, and what, they, what he wanted to do was he was sort of sick of of paper, sick of filing things, and so he just wanted there, he wanted that to be out of sight, and that you could press a button to bring up any number of folders in the, this machine underneath the desk. Instead of actually holding physical folders, it would hold the mechanism to retrieve folders from somewhere else in those drawers, presumably, right? And so uh, this is a way of thinking of early thinking about computing as a form of a database where um, the user wants something and they request that thing, they go through a series of steps, and those series of steps um, yield um, the results from the database. So this idea that the thing that we're very much used to, which is computing as a kind of what as a graphical user interface, which is, is more or less like what they call a WYSIWYG, is what you see is what you get, um, and what is clickable uh, is available to you, that's something that that kind of crosses over into a more analog world. Um, here's Vannevar Bush looking over one of his early um, machines. This right here is a an image from the ARPANET, and um, ARPA um, was the Advanced Research and um, Project Something Association, uh, and it's a military uh, organization that was started, I think, around 1958 by Eisenhower following the, um, the Sputnik launch. And what they did was they're uh, responsible for things like um, the internet and cell phones um, and a lot of very, very sophisticated technologies that we rely on for everyday use today. But it was primarily a military um, organization or agency. Uh, what ARPANET was, was it was a way of um, if you want to think about it in terms of telephone connections, right? So this is kind of how, how we're thinking about it. So if you look on this, you'll see that there's Stanford off to the left. That would be a, a University of Stanford. And then there's Aberdeen off to the right, Els Belvoir, um, the Pentagon down in the lower right-hand corner. And so if this were a more traditional circuit-based uh, uh, computer, what or, or not computer, like a phone uh, communication database, what it would be it would be one circuit belonging to one connection. So if the Pentagon wanted to talk to Stanford, there would be one connection, a whole series of lines that they would connect. Nobody else could be on that line unless you had a direct kind of connection to that line. But what they figured out was that, in fact, what we could do is create these packages or packets that are available at nodes. Um, and so Stanford, for example, could... Uh, could get get a variety of different. I mean, you could also think, get a variety of different communication packets or data um, along any of the trajectories that connect any of the potential users. So, in other words, it, it freed up the need for multiple individual connections because what could happen is these these packages could be these packets of data could be shared and accessed through a little local node. That's a lot like the way the internet works. So it's more like a rhizome. Um, Raymond Scott, uh, probably some of us will remember Raymond Scott's music. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna jump around a little bit, but um, uh, one of the things that the ARPANET created was the availability of different kind of data packages at any given moment. It kind of de-analog or de-analogized the, the connection. So in other words, like, um, 
you it wasn't a it wasn't a way that you could manipulate change borrow or uh, much like a painter's palette for example so a painter would have a palette lots of colors on the palette and mix and match the colors to make a completely different thing right that's a lot like the internet is now um, and artists were thinking about ways of creating the same type of of um, art with uh, this same type of logic except applied to electronics. And so in the 50s, Raymond Scott, who's a musician, um, he, he wanted to create a, a machine where he could do, uh, where he could create uh, a voiceover or, um, or sort of like a live, at the same time, synchronous music to any um, say an animation or a movie like that. So he created this thing called the videola, which looks kind of funny, but it's a big video screen in a in a, um, and then you can see off to the left there. There's some audio recording tape, and it's all linked into this piano that he's got going on. And what this allowed him to do was to watch the visuals that were created. And in this case, I think it was like an animation, and then simultaneously create an audio track that would accompany the um, the document and um, or the video and it would it would thus be c combined and then it would be uh, released on television right so this is very very early but it it's a different way of thinking about so for example if you think about movie making you go and you shoot your movies and then you might do some sound and then you might do some special effects you pull it together later but in this way, he was thinking, well, we just want to do it all at once. What if there was a simultaneity about trying to get all this information in to a particular narrative? So what? So part of the project... Time for you know, Richard Hudson Expert. Here's Raymond Scott with a quintet, dynamic version of his own composition, Our House. <laughs> might sound familiar from uh, anybody who's familiar with uh, Looney Tunes. You can see that digital, um, that overlay, that's the thing that's created by the sound. So he created this um, machine that would interpret sound and create a digital design or a digital kind of response to the music. And that's what that dancing light is that's going over this um, presentation here. This is all. This is also the, the guy who invented a lot of the cartoon music for um, early 1950s and 60s cartoons that are seen on television. I'm going to jump around again. Again, we're talking about database and narrative. Um, this is an um, artist named Jean-Michel Basquiat. He uh, has passed away, but he was an, a very long time ago in the eight 1980s. He was a mixer, and back then uh, what we would do is just use turntables and switch the inputs so that we could do crossfades and stuff like that. So you would mix one song into the next. Now, traditionally, say, a DJ, right, a disc jockey, was somebody who would, on the radio, play a record and then seamlessly uh, play a different record on a different turntable, but blend the sounds together with voiceover, advertising, and that kind of thing. So 
the original kind of DJ, the disc jockey, was somebody who actually was moving discs or records around. That's where it comes from. And trying to make sure that there was a somewhat seamless, um, or at least a seemingly seamless, uh, array of music or a story or whatever happening uh, over the airwaves. Artists like Jean-Michel Basquiat and other musicians began to look at this, um, I don't know if it was, want to say it's new, but it really, but the, the ability to sort of sample or take little pieces of one track, right, from one record, and then mix it with another, where you could do scratching, or maybe you could lay, it, lay down a different beat underneath it. This is very common now. You guys know what it is. You, pretty much every piece of music, pop music now, has some form of, of sampling. And the thing about sampling is, is that it runs up against notions of originality. Like, is it possible to have some, someone do something that's original that they didn't originally write? So Jean-Michel Basquiat was mixing music, and you could argue that his choices were the things that made that original music um, original. Sorry, made the music original. Um, but if you if you limited the notion of originality to authorship, then you might think, well, since he didn't write the songs, all he was was more like an arranger of things and not really an author of a new thing. But of course, there hip hop is used endlessly in this. Um, in this uh, example, which I won't, I won't belabor any more than it already has been. But one of the things I thought was interesting is that the computer and, and especially web-based interfaces, also networked video games, um, social media, these all more or less uh, now have completely absorbed the notion of remixing and sampling, especially like memes or like you know TikTok videos or whatever you know you might want to um, share with a friend. And it's usually this this sort of timely, temporary combination of music, video, images, and irony that people end up just sort of communi com in a community way kind of sharing, right? Jean-Michel Basquiat was also known as a painter. He was good friends with a guy named Andy Warhol. And as a, um, as a uh, mixer, as a, as a DJ, he also did painting, and his paintings were in some ways, I think it's a little bit too simplistic to say that they're sort of like visual uh, remixes, but because um, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of other examples of visual remixes, such as early collage work. Um, I showed you some work, I believe, by Romare Bearden earlier. But these are some of the paintings, and they, they probably look familiar because they've been used widely in uh, uh, a lot of advertising, I think. And um, also just, it's very kind of iconic, right? Um, and so what, what you end up with is uh, that the voice of the artist, it, and you could say, well, you know, my cat could draw that, that well. Um, I can write better than that, which really puts um, qu notions of quality on art to simply your ability to uh, execute something well or in a, in a very expert manner. And so uh, in the 20th century, at least, um, the idea of art being an idea as opposed to a product to start with started to take root. And one of the things that Jean-Michel Basquiat, I think, does nicely is blend um, that the idea is prescient and that in many respects, being an expert at a particular uh, medium isn't necessary for you to um, have a voice and share what you want to share. The other thing too, I'm going to go back one slide. You can start seeing colors, you can start seeing shapes, they're very childlike, but they're also, um, there is also something very sophisticated about them. And to that extent, they actually operate more like icons or symbols do, or in a synthetic way, so they're part to whole relationships. And so in many respects, this is kind of like the way that uh, we interpret this artwork depends on what we're bringing to it, interpretively speaking, right? <coughs> Pardon me. So the role of authorship has been around for a long time. The role, I mean, the importance of authorship and originality, the question of originality has been around for a long time. And um, in this piece, this is actually an artwork by an artist named Sherry Levine. 
And this is, in quotes, after Marcel Duchamp, right? Artist Proof, the AP. And Marcel Duchamp did the original Fountain in, I think, 1917. Uh, and it was lauded as, you know, this, like, really edgy piece of art. Um, but then, to what extent is does this new artist, Sherry Levine, um, copying that art, making it gold, to what extent does that make it a new piece, right? And this is also kind of, this also goes to um, a copyright. This is um, Pied Mondrian. Um, this is his early paintings i was i had a chance to see his early paintings and they were they were somewhat figurative they weren't this is uh and hopefully this is not the one that was upside down if it is just you know turn your ipad or something but um uh pierre mondrian was a theosophist and the theosophists um had a whole kind of network of philosophies about how things represented um meaning the reds meant something, the blacks meant something, the yellows meant something, horizontals meant something, verticals, and so on. And so uh, when it comes to referentiality uh, in art, Mondrian moved more toward this uh, kind of architectural abstraction. Um, and whereas you might say, well, it, it's, that's okay, it's just a bunch of squares, it doesn't take any skill to do that. But again, thinking through what ideas gave rise to this um, this end product is really now a part of the story of the art and not looking at art simply as um, a product. <coughs> this is an artist named Vic Muniz um, and he, these are um, portraits that are made out of the holes punched out of different colors in magazines. Uh, and these are painstakingly placed onto paper. You can see, and these are the, whole, the old hole punches. I don't know if anybody even punches holes in paper anymore. It might be that old. But um, again, like it, at once, what's interesting about his work is that um, you can look at it as a representation of a particular individual. Uh, a particular emotion being exhibited by that individual. Um, you can also ascertain perhaps age, relative health, um, you know, their style. But in point of fact, what you're looking at are a bunch of small punch out holes, uh, you know, from a hole punch that have been organized in a way f to get you to think that. And so what's fascinating kind of philosophically about it especially with regard to the computer, is that it flattens out everything that's represented into a field where its referentiality is contingent upon who reads it, right? So that's, that's something that you can think about when you're designing your narrative. Um, I think I already talked about, um, about this artist. This is an artist named um, Gerhard Richter. Uh, I'm bringing this up because I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to paint a picture about how we tell stories, this and then how those methods that we understand stories are some are more comfortable and some are in some respects they seem more robust. But in fact, uh, it could just be argued that um, the form of representation just hasn't had enough time to develop a language of its own. In this case. This is a, an abstraction that he uh, painted. Um, it would be easier if I could point at it. I'll use the mouse. Back in here, you'll see these fields of color. These fields of color would be what you call like a, the ground. And then these things that pop forward like this right here, it looks like a kind of a, a, a pipe or something round. Um, one thing that sits in front of another thing, That's those are the figures. And so this is what's called the figure ground relationship. And so to a certain extent, we can perceive space in this picture, right? Like this, this is over that and that's far receding. It's not necessarily telling us a story, just as Piet Mondrian's uh, was not necessarily telling us a story that we could read. That's the important thing, that we could read. And so when you're using codes as an artist, Sometimes you have to switch up your codes. This is also 
uh, Gerhard Richter. It's called 256 Colors or something like that. And I think it's based upon the 256 levels of brightness that was in early um, computer development. Same painter, same painter here. This is also Gerhard Richter. And this is oil paint, photorealistic. So he's mushing around the same bunch of paint here, 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 and there. That's also Gerhard Richter. So as an artist, as a painter, what's fascinating to me about Gerhard Richter, and something you might want to think about with your project is, how is what I'm using uh, in terms of the computer, right? If you think about the, your, your computer or software or even video software uh, as a kind of paint that you manipulate, how does the manipulation fall into different uh, habits of seeing? So for example, seeing paint mushed around on a canvas in this way depicts a very intent woman reading a newspaper somewhere, maybe at home. I always thought she was a dancer. I don't know why I thought she was a dancer. She seems like a dancer to me, but... Um, so I start making up stories about these things. Now here, I don't really have a story. I could probably think up one, but the story here ends up becoming a little bit more response oriented. Like, what do I think about those shapes? What do the colors make me feel? That kind of thing. Okay. Um, and these are all, so the one thing I wanted to mention here was that Gerhard Richter is remixing the history of painting. He's remixing abstraction. He's remixing this kind of architectonic painting. And he's also remixing um, very representational painting in the same in the same lifetime. A lot of times people will focus just on one. But what I think is unique about digital art is that it allows us to play in a lot of different playgrounds that we might in the past have been discouraged from doing so. This is Andy Warhol. This is uh, Che Guevara. And again, <coughs> you'll remember that when we talked about the parts of whole relationships in our visual literacy module, that using uh, or borrowing different images to connote or to bring up other topics um, is a lot like the way the internet works with kind of these packages that a person can access. And the thing is that the reading of the package doesn't necessarily guarantee that the message that's inherent to the package will be read in the same way that it was intended. This is uh, Andy Warhol's Campbell Soup Can. And to that respect, when I was talking earlier about this kind of flattening out of meaning, um, Andy Warhol kind of laughed all the way to the bank because he was he was kind of pointing out how obsessed we are with how referential things can be, even when the reference is something as simple as a Campbell soup can. This is an artist named uh, Roy Lichtenstein called Blam. Uh, Roy Lichtenstein became famous for using what's called the Bendey dot system, B-E-N-D-A-Y, that was used in early uh, comics. And he was kind of fascinated by early comic strips and how simple the graphics were and then what it, what did it mean to recontextualize that so that's another part of it is the recontextualization of these dots this is also Roy Lichtenstein this is another piece by Sherry Levine uh, it's a photograph um, this is uh, I believe Walker Evans um, and then this is after Walker Evans so she literally reprinted the the negative of this, uh, I think she's a Dust Bowl mom, uh, and and so Sherry Lou and Sherry Levine's doing it. She's really bringing in uh, issues about who's doing the representing, right? So why is it, um, in her perspective, well, I won't speak for her, but some of the issues that her work brings up is why is it that art history has mostly men in it? You could say, well, it's because of sexism and and patriarchy and male dominance and true enough and then um, the other question is what does it mean if um, if somebody like Sherry Levine takes artwork from a person whose nature whose very nature such as photography is the copy and then copies the copy and you could argue that 
memes or retweets or whatever you know one might do online is a kind of a re uh, capitulation of the original this is um, the graffiti research laboratory and um, I'm going to talk through this a little bit to try to give you guys a perspective. But they, um, the Graffiti Research Laboratory started to use technology to um, uh, kind of subvert the more traditional use of graffiti like on spaces that don't belong to us. And so they were really crossing the boundaries between what is public space, what is private space, and who gets to do what with that space. Um, and so I think they actually did get a ticket for doing this, and I don't know what the ticket was for, but they they would do these kind of um, guerrilla interventions in New York City, and uh, and just you know bring. And I think this was the I think it's a Perrier building. I can't remember, but um, it was political in some cases, and in other cases it was uh, is more heartfelt. So I'll show you another video that. Um, I think this is one that's kind of more to the point. The other neat thing about GRL is that they um, they brought up a really key issue, which is if we think about like a world in terms of territories, right? So in other words, we say websites. There's no site. It's just simply a collection of data over space uh, and communicated through wires or the Wi-Fi or whatever. Um, and so, just and if you think about public space, and you think about public visual space, um, you could argue that the internet or the web is one of the largest public spaces available. But increasingly, that space is becoming more and more uh, restricted. Uh, it's becoming, and part of that restriction is um, self-imposed, uh, and the other part of the restriction has to do with getting you to buy into something. So accepting something or another so i'm not trying to build a you know a big bet you know a big brother kind of a scenario but one of the things i do want to bring up in terms of thinking about narrative database and um and rethinking what belongs to who in your story i thought it was interesting to see the graffiti research laboratories work um around kind of just it's like interventionist art right and so part of, part of that buy-in that I was talking about with regard to the computer has to do with the graphical user interface. And that's that what you see is what you get thing, right? Um, and uh, it, it's not neutral. It's not culturally neutral. Uh, computers are not culturally neutral. There are whole epistemologies that run the subroutines that we use. Now, that's not to say that there's a big, you know, some Wizard of Oz kind of guy behind the scenes uh, planning everything out. And I know that people like to make boogeymen out of um, CEOs. But the graphical user interface was something that is meant to be transparent. It's meant to, to fade into the background. And so uh, when we're using computing computers, uh, no matter what it is, even if it's like Procreate, it doesn't matter. The thing is, is that... Um, uh, just as we don't think about the language that we're using and we might focus more on how we're saying it or to whom we're saying it the user the interface is similar in, in that respect so the more familiar you become with the interface the more invisible it becomes to you the question really is uh to a certain extent is well um you could you let me give you an example of language in spanish and many of the um uh so-called romance languages right that are in Latin and based, um, they are gendered languages. So you have a, a masculine and a feminine article in language. Uh, and so one question you could ask you, ask is, well, if if the primary tool that I'm using to sculpt and to create meaning in my life and get things done is a gendered uh, language, does that impact the way um, that I can think about what's possible? And that, that's a real real question. The same types of questions are also um, leveled at computers. 
And one of those questions is a little bit easier to pick on a computer rather than a language because we're kind of stuck with language, right? You might, you might also think we're stuck with computers, but we're not. Computers are, uh, in many respects, kind of a, 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 an extension of language. So um, just something I wanted to bring up to you is that it, what does it mean to be creative with a tool that is designed to mimic this infinite number of possibilities, like in Photoshop, simply because of its scope. It's just so big, right? Um, that illusion of, um, of immensity is part, part and parcel of that immensity is to do with the, the degree to which that computer program wants to remain um, an invisible uh, part of your creative process. And so I remember early on when there were a wide variety of, of applications uh, and every application, I remember when Photoshop was very, very young, like 2.0, and its interface was one of the first visually um, dominant interfaces. A lot of them before that were more vector. Uh, Photoshop was primarily a vector-based program at, for, at first, and then later kind of got into pixels. But um, So in terms of the remix and the database and the narrative, one of the um, primary things I want, to, want you to take away from this is... Um, is to kind of consider the computer uh, not just as a sort of culturally neutral tool through which we can do and draw and that kind of thing, um, but it does come from somewhere and it does have a particular demands. It makes demands upon us that we end up um, uh, kind of acquiescing to because in many respects we must. So um, this will be part one and um, I'll, I'll post some more for you guys a little bit later with regard to how you can create your own. But for now, what I'd like to, uh, your own project, sorry, what I'd like you to do is just be thinking about those prompts that are on the project uh, and creating a short narrative or anti-narrative. Um, and uh, it could be video, it could be a series of still images, um, it could be uh, voiceover, it could be anything. Okay, so I'll give you some examples in a little bit and uh, just wanted to give you guys a heads up on how this is going to um, start out. So I'm kind of combining a couple of uh, modules here. All right, look for part two.